Can I say hello? Welcome, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Welcome, everybody. My name is Nina Jane, and I am one of the programming librarians at the Cary Library, and I'm so excited to be here um, that I'm going to forget everything I need to talk about before <laughs> I actually introduced Mary. So I'm gonna to get to my notes so that I don't forget. So first, the welcome. Second is we do have captions for this program. Um, you might see them across the bottom of your screen. If, um, if you don't want them, there's a button that says live transcript. So if you an arrow, you just click on that and you can disable them with hide, trans hide subtitles. Or you can enable it if you'd like to have them. Um, for all of our programs, we like to thank our foundation, the Cary Library Foundation funds all of our adult programs and we could not do this without them. Um, you can buy Mary's books from Bank Square Books. I'll put a link in the, um, in the chat for you guys. Um, they're not signed, but they're still gold. So I would run over there and get them. You can even um, pre-order Mary's books that are coming out in the next few months. Um, we're gonna uh, have questions in the Q&A if you wouldn't mind and on Facebook where we are live streaming and I see people are already writing comments to there. I will let you know there are comments over there. And please use the chat for comments and tech issues. I'll be paying attention to that, but I will be asking questions from the Q&A. So without further ado, I am going to introduce Mary Bellog, who is one of my absolute favorite historic romance writers. She's an, an icon in the field and she's been writing for many years and has written books that are surprising and engaging and interesting and different and um, ones that you just cannot put down. So um, I did want to say one thing is that I learned that you pronounce Mary's last name Bellog, as in Kellogg, <laughs> like your cereal. Yes. Um, so that was something new. And I do want to tell a quick story before uh, we get started with questions, Mary, because I was obviously so thrilled for you to be here. Many years ago, when I first started reading again after I had my kids, because you know you don't read when you have little ones, I decided I had to have all of your books. And I bought them. I, I went to eBay where they would sell these packages of books, but you had to, they were auctions. So I, there was one that I was following and it was ending. I was heading down to DC to visit my parents. It was ending just that day. So I actually planned my entire trip so that I could win your books on eBay. And I got to my brother's house like five minutes before the auction ended. And then one of my kids needed something and I missed out. Oh. <laughs> this is like 20 years ago and I still remember it. <laughs> Needless to say, I did eventually win, find, get all of your books, including the Whitman, which we will be talking about. So my first question to you, Mary, is, Tell us about how you got started writing. I know your first book was A Mass Deception in 1985. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that. About A Mass Deception? About the process of starting writing. Right, well, I'd always wanted to write. I, as a child, I used to write long, long stories all the time. And I always said I wanted to be a writer when I grew up. But of course, when you grow up, you discover you have to eat. So, um, you know, you need a regular job. So I moved to Can I moved to Canada I taught for 20 years but um, after a while I was married I had children and my youngest child this was 1983 so she would have been six my youngest was six and they could sort of look after themselves so I started in the evenings after I had all my classes prepared and all my marking done I taught English I just started as pure hobby writing and uh, just thought of it as a hobby. And when I had the book finished, actually it was my third book, I had two rejected by Harlequin, but it wasn't really my type of writing. But when I finally chose to write a Regency, which I loved reading, uh, I finished it in about three months, longhand. Uh -huh. I typed it into a, an old um, typewriter, packaged it up, found an address inside a signet regency, I think, and <laughs> found a Canadian address. So I sent it off there with a, with a covering letter about five lines long saying, more or less, I've written this. I wondered if you'd be interested. And of course it was a distribution center. It wasn't a, an editorial house at all, but someone there read it and sent the book on to New York. 
And I had a phone call and the editor said she, she loved it and she wanted to give me a two book contract. So I haven't looked back since then. <laughs> that was 1983. It was published in 1985, sorry. Yeah. You were a teacher at the time. I, I was teaching high school English, yes. And I was a, a school principal. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's fascinating that they offered you a two book deal just on that. I think that's I know. I know. I was quite alarmed. I thought, oh, my goodness, I'm going to have to do this all over again now. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Once once Mary hit, you know, um, so I'm going to go through my questions before I get to everybody else's, because, um, you know, I've been waiting a long time to do this. First of all, Slightly Dangerous is my absolute favorite <laughs> historical romance. You want a lot of people, yes. <laughs> You've probably heard that. Yes. So, I wonder, as you were writing that series, did you know it was going to be Christine and that character, that kind of character? No, no. I, obviously, I knew Wolfric, Wolfric was going to be last. And in, reader interest in him grew as the series progressed. And I got quite alarmed. I thought, oh, his story is going to have to be really special because everyone's really waiting for it. So I was thinking it through. I tried a few heroines on for size, you know, and they just didn't fit. And then from somewhere, Christine came along and she was it. I mean, she was so wrong for him that I knew immediately that she was the one, that she was she was perfect. So, no, she just popped out of nowhere. About where in the series did she pop out for you? Oh, just right at the end when I was actually planning his book. I had the others written. I knew I had to write his book, but I didn't have a heroine for it. So... Uh, that's when I was thinking of different types of women who would, who would fit. Mm -hmm. and I wasn't, wasn't satisfied with any of them until Christine came along, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, that brings up a, a question um, Heather is also asking on Facebook. Um, like when you approach your series um, or your books, how do you plan them? Um, you know, the current big question is, are you a planner or a plotter? No. <laughs> a pantser or a plotter <laughs> well I'm definitely um, a pantser but you can't really do that with a whole series I mean you can do it with the individ individual books of a series but if you're going to write a series you have to have an overall sort of structure if it's a family series for example you have to know right at the start who the members are how many of them um <laughs> where they live and something about the family dynamics in the background. Otherwise, you know, you'd get one book written, you'd come to book two and you'd be horribly stuck because, you know, you'd have to find a character who fit in with that background. You'd set up in book one. Once book one is written and published, then you're sort of stuck with an awful lot of stuff for the rest mm -hmm. of the series. So it does need some planning, some outlining. But the individual stories don't come until I start. They don't even come when I start. <laughs> they come <laughs> as I write each book. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, we're getting um, in, in the chat, uh, people from all over the world are here and they're talking about the, some of your fav their favorite books of yours. Um, the Secret Fair and The Arrangement, uh, Christina Wolfric, The Temporary Wife, La um, A Matter of Class, I have to ask about that one because a matter of class, it's so different, but so yes. amazing. I know. Um, I think I was trying, I, I've been trying this without any success for about the last 15 years. I've been trying to go into a sort of semi-retirement, you know, and write just one book a year. But um, my agent said to me at one point, she said, you must be a bit bored because you're not writing over this winter. You're not starting again. She said, how would you like to write a, a novella? And um, there's a publisher asking, they want you to write a novella. Um, and you know, it doesn't take very long. So I said, sure. And I really don't know where that story came from. It is very different from all the others. And I, I can't even remember what sort of process I used or where it came from or how it came. But um, it, it's, it's very popular. People tend to love, well, some people will buy the book, perhaps online without actually seeing it. And some of them get very annoyed because they're paying full price for what turns out to be a novella. So I, I have that. But people who do read it um, tend to really love it. Mm -hmm. 
but yeah, it is very different. I, I wrote it in a totally different sort of format, and uh, I think I was it just is. experimenting. Well, it was a hugely successful experiment. Mm -hmm. I remember, I remember reading it the first time, and I remember thinking, I did not see that coming. <laughs> All right. Yes, most people don't. Some people do. Really? But, uh, yes. It was so clever. I thought it was really well done um, <laughs> and different. And because you don't see that in historical Romeo, you don't see those kind of twists and plots. Um, right, right. Yeah. So, um, so somebody in chat just talked about Silent Mel Melody, which is another one of my favorite um, because it's different. Again, when people were writing historical regencies back in the 80s and early 90s, there was a certain formula, which I always felt like you did not follow. No, I didn't. No. And can you talk a little bit about that? Just not okay. following the crowd. Yes, I wanted to write my own sort of books. I wanted to write Regency books that were in the tradition of a Regency um, with all the atmosphere and, and sense of romance that, that comes from them. But at the same time, I wanted them to be real. I didn't want them to be fluff. Uh, which I'm, I'm not accusing of all, all other regencies of being fluff, but I didn't want my own to be fluff. And I just wanted to deal with real life issues. And um, it, it, people were always, you know, reviews, they almost invariably started with, although she breaks all the rules of regency romance, da, 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 da. And I kept coming back and saying, would someone please show me these rules? There are no such rules. It's just a sort of convention that everyone thinks is what's expected. I didn't stick to that. I, uh, I wanted my own versions of Regency and of reality. That's an interesting concept too, of reality of those times, because um, was it the secret pearl where um, she was a prostitute, right? Was that the, yeah. Yes. Uh, and the male character had been in some of your other books and um, we were like, oh, great, you know, what's he? like, he was kind of like the, he was a character in other books. Anyways, the point is, is that I really liked that it was a different perspective. It wasn't always the Dukes and the Viscounts and stuff, it was different. Well, you know, prostitution was a very real thing in Regency England as it is in any historical age, but, um... You know, sometimes I, I don't want to deal just with the glamour of the Regency age. Um, you've got to tread a fine line because people are reading a romance and it's escapism. And they want to enjoy it and feel good. Mm -hmm. So I don't think you can, I, I don't want to get totally into the seamier side of life. But, um, you know, if I can make a heroine out of a, a Regency prostitute, then I'll take on the challenge and do it. I've done it more than once. Mm -hmm. Yeah, somebody mentioned um, more than a mistress. Yes, <laughs> that, yes, another example. Yes, one of my favorites, of my personal favorites. I, yes. I loved writing that. Loved really? Being, yes. Can you tell me why? Um, one reason is that both the hero and the heroine are I hate the word feisty, but I think it's the only one that maybe describes them. They're both feisty people. They're both um, alphas. And neither one of them will give in to the other or let the other one get away with anything. They've always got a comeback. Mm -hmm. um, so they have a confrontational, argumentative, but very sensual relationship. So um, I think that those characters are so different from me as mm -hmm. a person that it's sometimes it's great fun to enter into characters who are totally different from yourself. It's almost like putting a costume on and going to a Halloween ball and you can behave totally differently from the way you normally do because you've got a costume on. <laughs> That's true. I mean, an author, I mean, you can jump into any, any yes. skin, right? <laughs> absolutely, yes, yes. Um, this is an interesting question from Jackie. Um, can you talk about writing disability and disabled characters in your stories? What research do you do? Because I had this question too, um, in today's views of disability, as well as Regency Society's views of the disabled, um, because your Survivor series really brought PTSD to the fore. Um, so 
research? No, honestly, I don't research things like this. I just jump inside the, the person and imagine what it must feel like to, to have lost your sight forever and to have to cope. Uh, mm -hmm. this, you know, that's character in the arrangement. Um, you know, he had terrible panic attacks. Occasionally he would wake up forgetting that he was blind and he'd have a full blown panic attack. And I could just feel that from the inside. Um, and his way of accepting it and absolutely not giving in and finding a way to live despite the handicap, I do it all from now, when I say I don't research, obviously I read and watch and see and, and witness, but I don't do any special research. Terrible of me, but um, I always hold my breath until people read the book and come back and say, oh, you got it. In the case of Silent Melody, I didn't realise that my editor at the time had a deaf daughter. Mm -hmm. My heroine was deaf. And she said, oh, you just get it spot on. <laughs> Great, <laughs> because I didn't research it. I just, you know, imagined what it would be like. In the 18th century, when there wasn't even any sign language or any Braille or mm -hmm. um, deaf people very often ended up in um, insane asylums, as they were called. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, one of my other favorite books is um, Flowers in the Storm by Laura Kinsale. And that's exactly it. He ended up. Oh, yes. oh yeah. powerful book. Yes. But you took a different route in that um, your characters all support each other in order to get to healing and yes. they're happily ever after. Yes. Uh, is that a conscious decision when you first outline what you're going to write? I think that ties in, <laughs> excuse me, with what I said earlier about planning a series and you have to set it up at the start. Um, and I got this idea of a, you know, a group of uh, mostly officers who had fought in the Napoleonic Wars and all of them had got variously wounded, not necessarily physically, and they'd all gone to the same place to convalesce and they'd been there together for a few years. And they had this, this great bond of support and they, they called themselves the Survivors Club. And they did have meetings in which they compared notes and anyone who had a particular problem would talk to the whole group about it. So I did plan that out ahead of time. And then of course, each one in turn got their full story told. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, yeah, that was very different. I, I, I enjoyed writing that mm -hmm. series. Um, so why the Regency period? Why did you start writing about the, about that time um, and continue to do so through your entire career? Through thick and thin. Um, well, I tried a few contemporaries and sent them to Harlequin. I mentioned that a while ago. They were justly and soundly rejected. Um, and then I was, I, I was reading Georgette Hare. I discovered her quite late in life when I was on a maternity leave. And I just absolutely devoured all her books. I just felt totally enchanted and almost nostalgic for that time, as if I'd lived there very happily mm -hmm. at some time. And, and suddenly, you know, it, it, it struck me like a gong over the head. This is what I should be writing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I did. <laughs> I, I did do a little bit of research in those days, but it wasn't easy. There was no internet mm -hmm. then. I don't think people now would realize how difficult it was to research before there was an internet. Did you have a local library that you used then? Well, yes, but it was very piecemeal. You know, I didn't even know what I was looking for half the time. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you couldn't just jump on the net and, and Google something. Right. So, but, uh, but, you know, I read a lot of books that had been written at the time, plus mm -hmm. Georgette Hare. Um, and I discovered, I hadn't known it, that other writers were already writing regencies, like at the time people like Edith Layton, um, Catherine Coulter, Joan mm -hmm. Wolfe. Mm -hmm. I discovered their books and um, I thought, yes, this is, 
what I want to write, but I wanted to write them on my own terms. I didn't want to be imitative. I think at the beginning, maybe I was a bit imitative of Georgette Hare, but I, um, I didn't want, you know, I, I tried not to. Mm -hmm. And gradually I think found my own voice. Yes, <laughs> I, would, I would absolutely agree with that. And I yeah. think that your books really hold up to the test of time. Some of those other authors, not authors necessarily, but some of the books by some of those authors haven't. Is that right? Yes. If you think about like the Me Too movement and, you know, yes. Um, yes. Even, even Bridgerton, you know, with a diverse cast of the TV show, uh, of the show, you know, that is more of a lens of what's happening now as opposed to what was happening when Julia Quinn wrote those books. So I find that your books really hold up to the test of time. That's good. I think maybe it's because I try to show my characters and get to know them myself, what I call soul deep. Uh, I don't know just about them. I know them from the mm -hmm. inside out. And um, it, it's, um, it's a process that continues throughout the writing of the book. I'm constantly finding those little corners of their soul that I haven't yet revealed. And so I think when you're writing at that level, you're writing about humans, not about any particular um, historical era or any particular convention or genre of writing. Um, those things are, are just the sort of outer dressing, but the actual content of the book is humanity, the human being. Okay. Right. And that's why it seems like it works for you to write across the spectrum of, um, you know, socioeconomic status and kind of position. When I was thinking about the, the Secret Pearl and No, no More Than the Mistress book, um, <laughs> I was thinking that some, in all instances, people, women felt like they didn't have choices. Yes. And they made the best choice for the situation that they were yes. in. Yes, the thing is, if you want to write something that is that people today can relate to, but you also want to write historical books, you, you have to really walk a very fine tightrope because you don't, you know, you want to be true to the time, otherwise you might as well not write historicals, but at the same time you want it to be relatable today. And it's a very it's a challenge. It's a it's a lovely challenge, actually, walking this tightrope. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, have, you do it really well um, because it's. I would imagine it's very hard with the changing climate of readers to continue to um, to engage as many as you do. Well, I think the thing is, I've been. I was talking about this with a group of writer friends a few evenings ago right from the beginning of my writing career, since I was first published in 1985, I've just sort of had blinkers on. I've just walked the same line, trying to get better and better, but uh, I, I never jump on bandwagons. I never do something just because someone else is doing it. I never try to follow fashions. I never think of the fact uh, it, it, that you've been talking about now that times have changed and we have to make ourselves more adaptable. I've just, stayed the course <laughs> head in the sand sort of attitude but if you're if you're if what you're writing has not been i'll say offensive for another word you know in the 30 years then why would you um i guess <laughs> yes actually maybe i shouldn't mention this but i will one of my books was offensive to a group um, about a couple of years ago, uh, one group accused one of my books of being racist. And there was a great little brouhaha in this, um, in this group mm -hmm. because I had a very, very minor character who was Chinese and he had taught the hero at, at the hero's strong request when he was a teenager. He had taught him um, certain martial arts and meditation and um, I was accused of being racist. Oh. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only time I think I've been accused, to, to me, I, the only one I've heard of. Oh, okay. Anything like yeah. that. You know, you, you always have to be careful. You, just, you don't realize maybe you're, you know, totally innocently and 
without any intention, you, you offend some. And once you offend one and they bring it to a group online, you get a little explosion of, um, and I'm never going to be Mary Bell again, sort of attitudes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, in, in one of the questions is, has that type of changed over time over the course of your career? And what I'm hearing is that, um, you know, the, in that book, just recently, um, somebody noticed that you're not of that background writing this character. Yes, and but, he, but he was in one paragraph of the book. <laughs> You know, he was a background just, character. He didn't appear. He was just in the in the hero's history. But yeah. anyway, you know, I, I I apologized. I tried to explain. You know, you have to listen to people. You can't say, "Oh, nonsense." That was my first reaction. I think, "Oh, nonsense." But you you, you know, you have to listen to people. Um, mm -hmm. if, if a group of people is offended, you have to ask yourself why. And if you are the one who offended them, then you have to ask yourself, well. What can I do about that? You know, do I stick to my guns or do I totally crumble and capitulate or do I try to understand and, you know, come to some sort of accord? Mm -hmm. Do you feel like there was a good resolution to that situation? I'm not sure. I hope so. I mm -hmm. hope so. I, I stay, you know, I, I could have just ignored it when I found this group chatting. I, I could have just tiptoed away, but I jumped in there and you know, chatted with them. I think they appreciated that, that at least I'd maybe had the courage to come before them and, you know, listen. So, you know that I think you're amazing, Mary, and I just love you a little bit more right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I tell you, it, it really upset me, you know, for days it, it, it upset me, but, um, you know, these things happen. Mm -hmm. Right, and you have the, what I consider the exact right attitude about it. Um, well, on Facebook, somebody asked, because you had mentioned like sort of semi-retiring, um, do you still have the same enthusiasm for writing now that I think it's your, how many books? <laughs> oh, I, it, it's over a hundred novels and novellas. Yes, I do. I, well, I wouldn't write if I did. I couldn't, I couldn't. Mm -hmm have to be totally involved on, on every level of your being if you're writing a book. It's not a mechanical exercise and it's not easy. I mean, it's something I absolutely adore doing, but it's not easy. Um, and yes, I, I, I'm just as enthusiastic now. Even though I try to take more time off between books, I've just taken the winter off. I planned to start a new book in April, but I actually started last week. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I can't. When the time comes, I can't wait to to get back. And the ideas are starting to generate, and I just want to start writing so I can sort them out and yeah, fill them in. Yeah. So that means a new book for us. So we're all like, yes. <laughs> it's a new series, actually. Really? Yes. Yeah. I was about to write. I've just finished the Westcott series, and I was mm -hmm. I've been adding. I was going to start adding a few books for leftover characters from the Westcott series, but I, I'm, I was up for a new contract and my editor wanted me to start a new series. And I thought about it and I thought, yeah, why not? <laughs> so of course, immediately my brain was ticking and ticking. So I've, I've got a new series sort of planned, planned out just in very broad outline. And I've started the first book. Okay, people, you heard it here first. <laughs> uh, can you tell us anything about it? People are like... <laughs> well, I, I don't have a title yet, yet for this first book, but I'm, the, the title is centered around a stately home called Ravenwood Hall. And the family is the Wares. So I'm just calling it the Wares of Ravenwood Hall. And then there's a colon and I've got Devlin because he's the, um, the hero of the first book. So I dream of easy titles of being able to use that basic title each time just with the different name of the family member. But I'm sure the powers that be will have something to say about that. We'll see. Um, it, it's it's a you know a country family of uh, mother and father. He's an earl, 
and the Countess and their five children, plus one illegitimate son that he had before his marriage who, who was grown up with them. And they range in age from 22 to 10 at the beginning of the book, but they begin the first few chapters are a sort of prologue, some great, it's a very happy family, very popular in the community. They do all sorts of things, but some great catastrophe, horrible family breaking catastrophe is going to happen a few chapters in. And then there'll be a break of about six years. And by that time, the hero will be 28 rather than 22, which is a little young for a hero. So uh, at least th this is the vague plan, I mean, as I say, I don't have it thought out. I don't know him very well yet, but um, I'm enjoying the first few chapters because it's all family and community and happiness. And Well, both on Facebook and on Zoom, people are like, yeah, that's weird. All right. <laughs> um, and on Facebook, Mary Ann asks, how long does it take to write one of your books? It's hard to wait for them. <laughs> it's, um, it generally takes me about four months. Um, but then it takes a lot longer for it to get published. For example, I have two books already written that aren't yet published. Uh, Someone to Cherish, which is the final book of the Westcott series, is due out in June. June 29th. June, yes, thank you. And, and then I've got uh, another sort of Friends of the Family Westcott book. It's uh, Lady Estelle Lamar's story that's due out in November. Now those books are already written and, you know, already. Mm -hmm. I've got two books written but not published. So this one, even though I should be finished it by the summer, it won't be out until sometime next year. I don't know when. Um, and you had mentioned something a little while ago that um, writing is hard. So a couple of people have asked me, what do you think is hard about it? I mean, of course, none of us think it's easy, <laughs> but what is particularly difficult for you? Um, what I've already been talking about, actually, the fact that I don't know the characters or exactly what's going to happen. And I find that I can move my, my story ahead a few chapters. And then I make new discoveries about the characters or about what happened to them. And what I wrote before doesn't quite fit any longer, so I have to go back and rewrite. And I would say by the time I get to the end of a book, I've probably stopped about 50 times and gone back and rewritten and smoothed things out. Mm -hmm. So it's, it, it is hard work. You know, the actual creation is one thing, but fitting it all together and smoothing it all out and making everything um, gel with everything else. That that's, it, you know, it takes, it takes a lot of thought and work. It's something I love doing. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, something is not not work just because you enjoy doing it. Right, of course. And the challenge yeah. can be interesting yes. too. Yes, or oh, it is. Keep it from getting stale. Now, one of the things I love about your stories is that sometimes you surprise us from a from a, bringing in a character from a previous, even like long ago book and weaving them into current books. Um, I just, before we had this talk, I thought, you just have the biggest spreadsheet <laughs> ever created. <laughs> Map, something? <laughs> I don't. No, sometimes I'm thinking of a, a new character I need, and I, I think, oh, so-and-so would fit there. And I wonder if I, if I fit that character in, if readers will notice, and then I have fun. Um, seeing if readers notice that, you know, Wilfrick, Duke of Bedwin pops up in a few books, for example, and uh, people always notice him if he pops mm -hmm. up. But uh, yeah, sometimes they just, and you know, really my, all my books are written more or less within the Regency period, which was 1811 to 1820, you know, incredibly short period of time. I've written over a hundred books. So if this was real life, of course, all these people would all know each, would know one another and, uh, you know, be intermingling and attending the same parties and balls. So why not show that, you know, if I need a, a ball guest to help out with something, well, bring in a character from another book. He probably would have been at that ball anyway. So use him. It's mm -hmm. fun, it's fun. 
Well, and it's like visiting old friends, so yes. probably. Yes, oh, it is. It is. <laughs> um, so, um, do you read books by other Regency writers? Um, I Normally, when I answer this question, if people ask, I say, no, I really don't read romance at all. Um, partly because I don't want to plagiarize, even unconsciously. I don't want to draw ideas from other people. And partly because it's so similar to what I do for a living that when I read, I want to read something quite different. But I have found that during the last year, you know, with a lot of quarantining, uh and a lot of yeah what's the word for it not not unhappiness but all the things that go with the the pandemic i have read quite a bit of comfort reading in, in the form of a few romances um i think my favorite has been robin carr i've just i'd never read her virgin river series before i've read them all um before i wrote though wrote, before I read those, I read quite a few of the Thunder Bay series. Mm -hmm. And now I found in the last couple of days, I started that again, you know, I'm reading it again. So um, Regencies, I do tend to avoid because I want to, I want my own world and don't want to be influenced by anyone else. It's also, I, I must confess that I, I hate coming across errors in other regencies, which doesn't mean I, I don't commit errors. Of course I do. But um, sometimes they're so glaring, they make me sort of angry in other books or, or you know, what books in which the characters behave far too much like contemporary, especially the heroines, and it, mm -hmm. it annoys me. Mm -hmm. So uh, I avoid them. But it's mainly because they're so similar to what I do that I want something different. Well, let's talk about tropes. Um, although your characters and your stories tend to be very, very different from each other in other regencies, um, the trope that I love that you use the most is the, uh, or it may, you use, is the uh, fake engagement. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, what appeared to that to you about that? You know, people living in the regency had very little opportunity to be together men and women, alone together, until after they were married. And you have, I have to respect this if I'm writing Regency stories. I can't have them just behaving as contemporary people do, you know, going out for dates or just going out together for whatever. Mm -hmm. There has to be a reason or an excuse for them to be together. And I think if they're, um, if they're engaged, the fake engagement, or if they're married, the marriage of convenience, mm -hmm. uh, then you can have them, especially marriage. It, it's wonderful to find an excuse to get these two people married before it's a happily ever after, otherwise there'd be no point in the book. And then take it from there because you have all sorts of opportunities to get them together. And even in the bedroom, if it's a marriage. So I think that's why perhaps it appeals to me. I always have to think of ways I can make sure that these people are together enough that a relationship and a romance can grow. It's not easy. Not, not if you're being realistic about it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, <laughs> Beverly has a question that I think is funny. Um, do you use a huge sized cork board to pin up your scenes and ideas? Because you, you, what do you use as a tool to keep everything straight? <laughs> I missed the beginning of what you said there. Oh, do you use a huge wall-sized cork board to pin up your scenes and ideas? I don't. The only thing I keep by me when I'm writing is, is a yellow pad in which I list all character names and all property names because I forget mm -hmm. them. Um, but I don't write anything else down anywhere. It's, I just hold it all. And I, as I say, I go back so many times rewriting scenes that... Um, and then, you know, when you're doing a final read through, it's pretty easy to spot the glaring inconsistencies, even even obvious ones like the fact that the heroine arrives at the ball wearing a green gown and halfway through she's waltzing in her pink gown. You know, I mean, you, you spot or at least you should spot these when you're doing a final read through. So, um, no, I, I, 
I pretty much managed to hold everything in my head. That's amazing. I can't even remember what I had for breakfast. Yeah, yeah, neither can I. <laughs> but, it seems, <laughs> but it seems to work when I'm when I'm writing. Mm -hmm. When people ask me that question, I think it is odd that I never write anything down. If, you know, would you think it'd get mixed up all the time? But I don't do I don't. Not often anyway. Sometimes I think, no. Did they do that or didn't they do that? And then I have to go back and find out. But not very often. Mostly mm -hmm. I can remember. What works for you, right? It's your system and yes. it works. Yeah. Oh yes. Oh yes, we're all different. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you have a, like a writing group that you work with, that you depend on? Um, I have a writing group, not one I work with. Uh, all my work is very, very private and nobody sees anything I've written until it's on my editor's desk. She's the first one. Um, but I do have a, write, a writing group. I have a larger group, which we, we, we meet once a month for coffee, um, or at least we did until a year ago. We've had a few Zoom meetings. We have one coming up next week. But I have a smaller group. Uh, we, we meet quite constantly, and we're constantly texting back and forth. And, you know, we, we run ideas and problems and concerns and jokes and the whole gamut of each other. And it, it's very um, encouraging. It's very um, nice to know that each of us cares about the others and is willing to commiserate or congratulate or whatever. I think a couple of those people may be part of this group tonight. I'm not sure. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Um, I have a question here from Nicole, which is interesting. I noticed the intimate scenes have evolved from the beginning of your, you know, when you first started writing to now. Is that more of societal or is that just more comfort with that? Or, I mean, what do you feel that? I wonder what she means by evolved, uh, because I think I probably have fewer and less specific um, sex scenes now than I used to. I, um, I haven't eliminated them entirely. I think they're important. I, I think it's an important part of a relationship to see the, um, you know, the sexual part of it too. But I don't wallow in it. And I, I, I certainly don't write a sex scene just for the sake, you know, because it's now page 252. So I need a 10 page sex scene right here. I don't do that at all. Just where one seems necessary. And if it's not until three quarters of the way through the book instead of 12 pages into it, well, fine and fair. So I would have said my sex scenes have devolved. Is that, would that be the right word rather than evolved? Hmm. Yeah, I'm, um, I find that interesting because you were writing sex scenes in your Regency, yes. you know, Very long good. before most other people were. Yes. So yeah. I, I, I enjoyed that. <laughs> well, I, I enjoyed writing them. I still do. And I, you know, I do think it's, it's an important part of a relationship. And I know some readers feel cheated if the bedroom door closes and they don't get to go in as well, you know. <laughs> so I still write them and, and you know, and in some in some detail, but I don't, I, I think they are briefer and maybe a little less graphic than they used to be, I think. I think it's interesting, some of the comments that we're seeing here about not the intimacy, but the fact that you really delve deep into your characters. And so the time spent maybe where other writers are writing, you know, more detailed sex scenes, you're really delving into your characters. Um, do you do you spend a lot of time with your characters or um, or is it like an even character plot type of thing? Uh, only as I'm writing, I, I have to be, um, because I alternate point of views between my hero and heroine. Almost none of my books is told by me, you know, as narrative, they're all told through the, through the eyes and experience, mostly of the hero and the heroine alternating. And if I'm going to do that, I have to know those characters as well as I know myself, if I'm going to do it convincingly. Um, you know, you, you can't just be sort of on the surface of someone's thoughts 
uh, as they're experiencing something and then they say something, uh, you know, where's the rest of them? Where's the rest of that person? And how does it impact the way they behave and the way they see things and the way they react, things they do, things they don't do, how they feel towards the other person. So I just have to keep getting deeper and deeper and deeper. And sometimes it's a real problem because I feel there's something I, I don't get about this character yet. So sometimes I even talk aloud to them and I say, you know, what is it about you I'm not getting? Where's your deepest pain? That's the question I most often ask. Where's your deepest pain? Mm -hmm. And then that, that very often will bring it out. And once I find that, then everything falls into place. I understand where they come from and you know why they are as they are and how they need to change and how they will change and how the other person will somehow help with that. So yeah, it's, it's a constant process. It, it's the main part of writing as far as I'm concerned. It's getting these characters right and then getting them to fall in love. And, well, that's an interesting concept about digging into the pain of a character. Um, do you feel like in order to have an authentic story or a, an authentic happily ever after, somebody has to have some sort of trauma in their life, in, in your stories? Uh, trauma, I'm not sure. Um, but I mean, most of my characters are at least in their middle twenties. Some of them are older. Well, none of us go through life, even childhood or, or uh, adolescence, without pain, without troubles, without some problem. It doesn't have to be some huge trauma, you know, that knocks you out and makes, you, makes it almost impossible for you to live. But we all have troubles and pain. Um, and these accumulate over the years. And we all, I think, have things we keep to ourselves, sort of inhibitions, um, things we don't want to share with others, things perhaps we don't even realize ourselves are holding us back from some things. And I've got to, I've got to know all of that. I've got to know all of that, or they can't behave authentically as real people. I can't just shape them to be the way I want them to be. They, they're not my creations. They're real people. I have to. I have to understand them. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because somebody just asked in in um, in the chat. How do you get to know them? Do you think of them as separate from you, or do you create them? So right there. <laughs> yes. No. I. I mean. I. I create them. To start with, you know, I create the shell, mm -hmm. and there are certain things I know about them, but from there, it's up to them. They, you know, then. They are real people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I have to know them. Yeah. And um, Marie asked this really interesting question. Um, many of your earlier works are being republished or re released in e format. Do you ever find yourself rereading them and wish you'd written them differently? Oh, yes. Um, some of them I haven't read since they were published 30 years or more ago. Now, in 30 years, I have changed a lot. For example, the, the, uh, the one that's due out on April the 4th, I believe, uh, A Gift of Daisies. Mm -hmm. um, the hero in that book is um, a vicar, a minister, a clergyman, um, who has found, he was a, a sort of playboy character, but he found the meaning of his life and he's extremely happy. He's not wealthy and what he does have, he tends to give away to the poor and he can't think of any better way to spend his life than ministering to his congregation. He falls in love with the lady of the manor, a seemingly very frivolous girl who um, is you know, very popular and she goes to balls and parties and she's you know, a bit empty headed, but very sweet. He falls in love with her. She falls in love with him. He's not willing to marry her because he, it wouldn't be fair to her and she couldn't fit in. I don't want to tell you the whole story here. But anyway, uh, you know, it's, um, it's a book that obviously I wrote based on my own religious faith at the time. Um, now, I won't say I've lost my religious faith in 30 years. I haven't, but I've 
it has changed completely. Mm. I wouldn't write that book now, especially this thing about serving the poor. I think, oh, come on, the poor could probably serve themselves when I was rereading this book a few months ago. Um, so that book, you know, I stand by it. It was heartfelt when I wrote it. And I always swore that when I republished old books, I would never rewrite them. They, they stand for themselves. So, um, you know, it can stand, people can read it and hate it, throw it at the wall, whatever they like. But it represents what I was when it was published. I can't rem remember the year, early 90s, I would think. Mm -hmm. But uh, And there have been a few books, not, not quite all quite as radical as that, but there are some I would love to rewrite and tweak, retweak. But I won't for the reason I've just given and also because I would rather use my time and creative powers now creating something new. Mm -hmm. um, and you do, every book is different. And, you know, there's like, for me, a lot of people have written that you're a comfort read for them because oh. there's a certain rhythm that is always you, but the stories and the, and the characters are always so different in some ways. That, that's nice to hear. It's the voice. I, I always say that a writer's most precious possession as a writer is his or her voice. And they're all distinct. And with the best writers, you can always pick up and open their books without even realizing it's their books. And as soon as you start reading, you think, oh, this is so and so. I can just tell by the voice. Even if you can't describe it, you know that this is so and so's book. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's very precious, your voice. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and have you found that because you have been writing for so long and um, have had such success, and now I'm not talking about money, I'm talking about with your readers, that um, you've been able to mentor other authors as they're coming up? It's something I would never do. Um, if anybody ever asks me, and people in interviews almost always ask me, what advice would you give to new authors? And the only advice I would ever give to a new author is write. Okay. And if I want to add a point to it, don't listen to any advice from published authors, because we are all totally different. You, you just have to find your own way, what works for you. You know, I, I may get, I do get up early in the morning and do all my writing before noon because afternoon my brain is dead. I know other writers who start writing about nine o'clock at night and write through the night. You know, to me, that's absolute madness. Mm -hmm. To them, that's what works. I mean, that's a very trivial example, but um, no, I, I wouldn't, I would never mentor someone but else. That that in itself is a mentorship to like let people find their way. Well, you know, you can give encouragement and if they've got any problems, uh, you know, you can listen and, and, and give advice and um, or just give your view. But I almost always add, look, you know, this, don't think you've got to do this just because I tell you, you've got to find out for yourself what works for you. Mm -hmm. Or if you don't like anything that I've suggested, it's fine, it's fine. Don't feel you've got to, just because I'm Mary Ballock, don't think you've got to do what I say. No, we're all different. So um, when we talked a, a minute ago about uh, your books being comfort reads, um, several people wrote that it's because there's such a deep vein of kindness in your oh. stories. Oh, I agree. That's nice. Um, it's a... There's a little post on my Facebook page. Was it today or yesterday? I think, I think it's this morning. But kindness, I can't remember exactly the wording of it, but it's a beautiful little quote and I put it on just as a, a sort of just because post on my Facebook page. But I think it's, it's what I try most to project. I'm not always successful, obviously. Sometimes I'm nasty and spiteful and... Uh, impatience and all the rest of it but you know to be told that people see kindness in my books that's very touching thank you to whoever said that <laughs> so talking about your facebook page 
many, many comments on all of the amazing puns. <laughs> well, that, that was pure accident. I just started occasionally, I'd, I'd see a, you know, a lovely pun and I'd put that on my Facebook with a pun alert. I always just say pun alert. And then people sort of caught on and all started sending me these puns. Now, I, you know, it, it's totally lazy. I, I, I find hardly any of them myself. People send them to me and I have all a whole folder of them all lined up to uh, to post. People love them. I love puns too, so I have, I have great fun. I post one almost every day. Uh, you posted one of mine a few months ago and I, I was like shouting it to the rooftops. <laughs> all right, did I? <laughs> Which one was yours, do you remember? <laughs> I have no idea. Oh, yeah. no, <laughs> I'm sure it was awesome, but I don't remember what it was. Well, you know, the, the sillier and stupider puns are, the better they are very often. You know, the ones that people say that we want a groan emoji here. And those are the best ones. <laughs> well, I think that your puns have gotten a lot of people through some difficult times, believe it or not. <laughs> well, me too, because I, I love going to the, the, the page where people send me these puns and I just laugh my head off. Some of them, I, some I can't use because lots of them have a copyright written at the bottom of them. And I was caught out uh, a couple of months ago. I used them one without realizing and Facebook threatened to shut me down. So now I'm very, very careful about making sure none of my, uh, none of the things I post have copyright written on them. And some of the best ones have copyright written on them. But, you know, fair enough. I didn't do it deliberately, but... Uh, no, of course not. They did it. But, which actually <laughs> yeah. brings me to um, another question about um, comfort is, you know, we've all gone through this very, very difficult year. Um, just, yeah, I just realized there's no light on in this room. I think our interview must have started before it grew dark. Just a second. <laughs> see if Mary's wearing pajama oh, yeah, pants. That's light. <laughs> oh, again. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Actually, when you got up, I asked everybody to keep an eye out to see if you're wearing pajama pants. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm wearing jeans. I did think of it. But, uh, I'm no, totally I'm... wearing pajama pants. So. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I won't show you, though. <laughs> um, what were we talking about? Oh, COVID. We've all been home. We've all been isolated. How have you kept up um, your ability to write during this difficult time? Um, actually... You know, my life hasn't changed a great deal because I'm a bit of um, a loner and a bit of a hermit anyway. Um, what I do for a living keeps me isolated at home writing. Um, I have everything that I most love in my, well, not everything, most things that I most love are in my home. So, um, but there have been a few irksome things, you know, always having to wear a mask when you go out, although actually it hasn't been too bad through the winter. It's like almost like having a scarf up over your nose. So I haven't mind, minded that. Um, I do miss seeing my family. You know, we, we Zoom, but it's not the same. I haven't, my, my uh, son and my younger daughter live in the States. I, I'm in Canada. So I haven't seen them at all for... Um, almost two years we, we all oh. got together for our golden wedding anniversary which was in the summer of 2019 I said afterwards bless us that we didn't wait another year to get married <laughs> we would have missed our golden wedding so we were all together for that and I haven't seen my um, son and younger daughter since one is in New Jersey one's in Texas I, my elder daughter's in Calgary, which, you know, that's in Alberta. I'm, we're in Saskatchewan, just one province apart. But I haven't seen her since Christmas of last year, 2019, and all the grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And it's, it's very hard. I, I don't want to whine here because I'm sure everyone who is watching and listening has a similar story. I mean, this is the common condition of people these days, and it's, it's very hard to bear. But in the main, um, I am, you know, we're, we're fine. We're, we're living life pretty much as normal. Uh, and I'm able to do my work quite nicely without, you know, needing to go out and be with other people. So I'm, I'm very well blessed. True, and I think that um, one of the things that I'm seeing in both Facebook and in Zoom is that people turn to reading 
and especially romance during this time. It's been um, not just a comfort read, but an escape. And um, there are many thanks in both um, to you for giving us that ability to escape in such a stressful time. Well, that's very nice. And of course, I, as I said, I have found it through other writers, particularly Robin Carr. But, um, you know, writing is an escape too. So it's lovely to know that I can escape myself through my writing and then that other people can read it and also escape through it. So it's uh, very nice. It's like the great circle of life. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, Somebody asked earlier, uh, you had mentioned that A Summer to Remember was one of your favorite books to write and maybe read. Um, are there other of your, own, of your own books that you really, really liked? Well, you know, I stand by all my books, although some of the older ones, as I've said, you know, I wouldn't write just the same way now. Um, I think they're all favorites when I'm writing them, but, well, I mentioned More Than a Mistress, Oh, more than uh, a summer to remember is always one of my favorite books that's probably the book that gave me most trouble to write of any book i've ever written but now it's you know it's once it was written and published it's a real favorite um slightly dangerous obviously um i like i, I like i love simply love which has very handicapped um, hero and heroine um I think all the survivors books I have a very soft spot for all of those. The one I had most fun writing was probably um, only a kiss. Imogen's mm -hmm. the one, the one woman uh, of among the survivors. Um, I loved writing her book. Um, I loved the Westcott series, which I've just finished. I, I just got very attached to that family. They got very real to me and I just enjoyed telling their stories and catching up with all the, the ones who'd already had their stories told. I could go on forever with that series, writing stories for minor characters, but um, we'll see with this new well, series. We'll yeah. expect to see them, you know, those minor characters in future books. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Yeah. Um, okay. So, um, <laughs> I had a question for you that I've completely forgotten. Um, when you, uh, do you go to like conferences or things like that to, um, to meet other authors, to meet your readers? Yes, I haven't for quite a while, for obvious reasons, for a year or so, but um, before that, not for a while. But I used to, early in my career in particular, um, the writers of Regency romances, particularly the signet regencies, which I wrote, there were quite a lot of us who wrote the Regency romances. And we liked to go to those conferences and spend most of our time together. Um, and, and it was just lovely. It, it was, you know, again, it was, it was before the time of the internet. So we couldn't do Zoom talks or even email or texting or anything. It was just, and these annual, meetings either at RWA or Romance Writers of America, that is, or um, Romantic Times, which no longer exists as a, as a magazine. Um, I don't think either one of them really exists anymore. I mean, RWA sort of went. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. yes, it did. Yeah, and they, they, were, they were huge conventions and they were, they were great fun, but it was nice to have a sort of core group that you could spend your time with, otherwise you can be lost in a crowd, especially if you tend to be, um, you know, a bit on the shy or retiring side. I think it was Mary Jo Putney who always used to say that readers at a convention or at a convention, um, readers, how did she put it? it uh, conventions are full of introverts pretending to be extroverts. <laughs> I think she was quite right at, at a lot of readers' conventions because lots of writers are introverts. Maybe that's why they're writing. It's easier to express yourself and do your living through your writing rather than face-to-face -face with other people. Mm -hmm. um, well, if you speak to Mary Jo Putney, let her know that I love her Fallen Angel series. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, one question, which you sort of mentioned earlier that you tried to write some contemporaries early on in your career, but then didn't 
you know, they didn't take. If right. you had a if you could write another, if you wanted to write another um, genre, what would it be? Not to tell, just for fun. <sighs> Mystery, maybe. But I, I have no wish to write anything but what I do. Um, I love reading mysteries, but that doesn't mean that I could write them or that I would enjoy writing them. I don't know. I mean, with mysteries, I think you'd have to be very disciplined and have everything planned out ahead of time. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure I could do that. I don't know. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like you could do anything, but the, no. the answer you gave is, is perfect, that you are no, completely I'm, happy doing what you're doing. Yeah, no, my voice is, I think it's suited to the type of literature I write. I'm not sure it would be suited to any other type. It's too formal um, a voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a couple of people have mentioned that um, your books are, are they're funny. <laughs> you don't expect it, but they have humor in them. And um, is that something that, that comes, like, are you... You know, do you do that purposefully or do you just think that those characters need to be a little bit funny to deal with the harsher stuff? It's not, I don't think it's something I do. I mean, it's not something I tack on. I think, oh, I need a little bit of humor here. I'll throw this in. It just comes organically. I, I just, I like humor. Um, I very often see things in a humorous or ironic way and then it comes through in my writing you know sometimes I I'm not expecting it myself something comes out either in my narrative voice or more likely in things characters say say and it's humorous or at least to me it's humorous but I didn't really intend it it just appears sometimes I think I'm sort of a ghost writer you know that stuff comes through me Mm -hmm. I don't always know. Well, I I don't very often know what's going to, I was going to say, come out on paper. It's not on paper. Appear on my screen uh, until it's there. Um, so, no, I don't do it deliberately. I have to say that when Christine held up the Duke's glasses <laughs> in Slightly Dangerous, I howled with laughter. I thought that was the perfect, perfect moment in that book. When she held them up at the bowl, Mina you know, held it to her eye? Oh, yes. <laughs> I just thought, you've been waiting six books to do that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, uh, Nicole wants to know who are your favorite mystery writers? Oh, isn't it funny how your mind goes blank when someone actually asks a question? I love um, Michael Connolly, um, Robert Parker. Uh, I, I love his, his Spencer books. Ah, love them. Um, I, Patricia Wentworth, I read all of her. There, there, she was a contemporary of Agatha Christie. I actually like her books better than I get the Christie books. Um, it, as soon as I walk away later, I think, oh, yeah, of course, and so and so and so and so and so and so. Uh, okay. That's okay. I was actually thinking, isn't Louise Penny also? Oh, Louise Penny, yes. She's one I would have <laughs> Louise Penny, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, yes. She's a fellow Canadian, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. From, from Quebec. Yes. Rather a long way away, but same country. I'll take credit. <laughs> <laughs> it yeah, is a big country. <laughs> I love Louise Penny's books. Oh, and on a similar sort of line, uh, Donna Leon mm. writes mysteries set in Venice. I love mm -hmm. her books. I'm glad you mentioned Louise Penny because that made me think of Donna Leon as well. Yes, I love their books. Very good choices. <laughs> yes. yes. Um, so we're about out of time. Um, Mary, thank you so, so much for this, your time, your consideration, your incredible kindness come through in talking to you and reading your books. And um, I am very, very honored that you chose to spend some time with us. Well, that's lovely. I'm sorry I can't see all the rest of you, but uh, you know, thank you so much for coming. It's such, um, it's such an honor to be 
the center of such attention. It's it's lovely. Thank you so much. It's yeah, been fun. Thank you, Mina, for inviting me. Absolutely. This has been um, a thrill. You'll see on Facebook later, I'll be like, oh my God, he's finished talking to me already. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to thank everybody for being here, both here and on Facebook, because um, without you, we wouldn't have had some amazing questions and wonderful conversation. So um, Mary, I will send you the chat and, the, and you'll see the comments on Facebook if you want to respond to them. And right. um, you'll see people have been here from all over the place and really, really love your book. That's lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Have a wonderful evening.